Hello, this video is going to cover chapter 9 for our introductory chemistry class. So chapter 9 is called Electrons in Atoms and the Periodic Table. So we're going to focus most of the time on that first half of the name, the electrons and atoms. Um, we're going to talk about electron configurations. And then the second half or second portion of the chapter, we're going to talk about trends within the periodic table. So do a little adjusting here. It's a little better. So in previous chapters, we've talked a little bit about trends and we've talked about that noble gases are very inert and alkali metals are very reactive. This chapter is going to start to explain the why behind that. And in order to explain that, we're going to talk about two different models, the Bohr model of the atom and the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Now, up until this point, we've used the nuclear model. Now, both of these models have good points and bad points, um, and there's a lot of different ways in science that we use to kind of explain things. You can kind of think of them as as very fancy nerdy analogies and we need to have different analogies or different models to help us explain different things. So the fact that we have these two different models they don't cancel each other out they each have their own purpose. Oh yeah and both models really shocked the science world. Um, they were kind of undoing a lot of information that previous scientists had put forth. So there's a, a quote from Albert Einstein, and I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember it word for word, but it says something like, if you're not shocked by, by quantum mechanics, then, then you don't understand it. So we're gonna start actually by talking about light. And the reason why we're talking about light is because Learning about light helped scientists to develop the first model we're going to talk about. Light is a type of electromagnetic radiation. Um, electromagnetic radiation incorporates all different types of light. So we often talk about light we can see, but there's a lot of other types we'll see in a couple slides here. And light travels in a wave. And so when we talk about a wave, we have four different characteristics that we use to describe that wave speed, the wave speed, the height of the wave or the amplitude, the wave length, and then the number of wave peaks that pass in a given amount of time. The speed of the wave is the speed of light. It's how fast it's going. And so we abbreviate this with a lowercase c. And it's constant. It's the speed of light. So it's 2.99 times, or excuse me, I stopped in the middle there, 2.997925 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We normally write this as just 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Very fast. Doesn't change. The amplitude, which is abbreviated with a capital A, is the height of the wave. So for example, From here to here is my amplitude. So this wave has a much smaller amplitude compared to this wave, which means that the one on the bottom would be a brighter light. Wavelength is the distance between crests, and I have a, a picture to demonstrate that on the next slide. It's abbreviated with the Greek letter lambda. For our purposes, because we're talking about atoms, subatomic particles, electrons, we are normally dealing with these in nanometers, but wavelengths can also be very large. And then it does say here that it's the distance between troughs, nodes, or crests. So again, I'll point out those words on our next slide as well. And then the last one is frequency, and this is abbrevi abbreviated with the capital, not the capital, excuse me, it's abbreviated with the Greek letter nu, and it's how many peaks pass a point in a second. So if this is my wave, every time it passes the side there, we would count that. So however many peaks there are per second. And so the units for this are waves per second. It can also be written in hertz is our abbreviation for that. 
So here's a couple waves just to show a difference. We have a wave, a short wavelength on the top, so we're measuring from here to here to get that wavelength, or here to here to get that longer wavelength on the bottom. The top of the wave is a crest. The bottom of the wave is a trough. So we would also get the same distance if we measured from trough to trough. And then anytime it crosses the, the middle there, that's called a node. Now the wave on the top has a shorter wavelength, which means that it has a higher frequency. So if we pictured this wave in motion and going across the slide there, it would be how many times a crest passes off the edge of the slide. And so because those waves are closer together, they're going to be passing by a lot more frequently. And then the bottom one has a longer wavelength, which means it has a lower frequency. The waves aren't going to be going past the edge of that page as often. So we have a couple more light, light wavelengths here. Um, and the information on here is telling us that we can think of a particle of light as a photon. And there's two ways to think about light and to think about electrons, and this is where their similarities come in. They do have wave-like behavior, and so that's essentially all the characteristics we talked about on the last two slides, but they also have particle behavior. And so with a photon, a particle of light is defined as a photon. And another way to phrase this is that it's a packet of light energy. So meaning that it's a small container, small bundle of, of energy provided by the light. And this was a, um, a definition that was provided by Albert Einstein and Max Planck, so both physicists. And there's the biggest relationship connecting light as a wave versus a particle is that there's a relationship between wavelength and energy. And when we have a longer wavelength, we're going to have lower energy. So looking at our two light waves up here, this one has a long wavelength and this one has a short wavelength. So again, we're looking at that distance between crests in this, in this example. And so if it has a long wavelength, that means it's going to have a short frequency, and this one's going to have a larger frequency. And that means that this one's going to have small energy, and this one's going to have larger energy. So the frequency and the energy have the same relationship. If the frequency is small, the energy is small. If the frequency is big, the energy is big, and they both have an opposite relationship to the wavelength. So as our wavelength goes up, energy and frequency go down. Here are all the different types of electromagnetic radiation, and they're in order. Over here we have low energy, and on the right hand side we have high energy. On the left hand side, we also have large wavelength, small frequency, and on the right hand side, we have small wavelength, large frequency. And so we can see that represented by the red wavy line there. We also have the actual wavelength, and notice that it's in meters. I'm gonna erase my circle over here and redraw it. So I kind of blocked out a number there. There we go. And so on the left hand side, we go all the way from 10 to the fifth meters, all the way down to 10 to the negative 15th meter. So it's a very large scale. In the middle there, pictures are a little blurry. I stole them and insert them, but I liked the visualization. But we have some size reference and and so going on the, the far left over here, our wavelengths are anywhere from the size of building. So that means as we're measuring from crest to crest, 
it's the length of a building. So going from buildings to the size of humans to honeybees to a pinpoint, protozoans, molecules, atoms, all the way down to a nuclei. And in the next, where the blue arrows are right here, it's showing us all of the different types of electromagnetic radiation. So going from large wavelength down to small, we have radio waves. And radio waves also include like any TV signals, it's what our cell phones use. Microwaves, the microwave you have in your kitchen that uses microwaves to heat up food. Infrared radiation. So we normally think of this at, um, if you play any video games and you wear the, or your character wears like the heat goggles and you can see infrared light. Um, that is what you're seeing. You're seeing a type of electromagnetic radiation that is shown in the form of heat. In the middle here, in this tiny little section, is visible light. And then we have ultraviolet radiation, so we normally think of this as what comes from the sun, can be damaging. Down to x-rays, and then gamma rays. So I do want to add in, add in a little bit of energy information. So we know that our high energy is on this side, and low energy is on this side. So notice that once we get past visible light, we do have things that we know can be damaging to us. Ultraviolet light can cause sun damage to our skin and sunburns. I have freckles all over. Um, I'm very pale and white. And so I do get sun damage very easily. And what's happening with that ultraviolet light is it's actually breaking bonds in your skin and creating sun damage. And then x-rays, you know that if you go to the dentist, they put a big lead vest on you to protect you from the x-rays it's because they can be damaging so we want to limit our exposure and then gamma rays are something that hopefully none of us will ever have to experience but they are what comes from nuclear explosions or, or exposure to nuclear reactors so let's get down to that very bottom section where the visible light is. So we can only see light if its wavelength is in between 750 nanometers and 400 nanometers. So we have a very small range of light that we can see. And notice that the scale, the, the rankings are the same. So meaning our red light is the largest wavelength, smallest frequency, smallest energy, and our violet light is the smallest wavelength, largest frequency, largest energy. So here's a little bit more visual on our visible light. Um, and one of the ways to remember the colors is Roy G. Biv. So this stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So you've probably heard this before, maybe not. I definitely learned it from watching um, Bill Nye the Science Guy growing up. Uh, but I also liked this graphic because it's showing us the difference in wavelength and it has frequency and energy on there as we move throughout the colors. Now the graphic doesn't have all the colors represented, but it does show that change as we go from the red side to the violet side. So a good way to memorize those colors. Now atoms can absorb energy, and they can absorb energy in the form of heat, or light, or electricity. I'll put my little video there. But when they absorb this energy, it puts them at a higher energy level, which in terms of chemistry means that it's less stable. So that means they have to eventually release that energy. And when they release it, it always gets released in the form of light. So I have the little Mickey astronaut neon lights here to, to kind of explain this or show an example of it. The atoms that are inside of those lights are, are hydrogen for the pink and mercury for the blue. And we hit them with electricity. The electricity goes into those atoms and makes them excited but when they relax back down, they release that energy in the form of light. 
and different atoms are going to show up as different colors because they have different amounts of electrons in different locations for their electrons. Now if we take the light that's coming off of one of those neon lights and we put it through a prism, so we put it through something that can break it apart, what we see are individual lines. So this is hydrogen and we can see um, our specific lines here for our hydrogen emission spectrum. So this is showing us the very specific energy levels that are being emitted by a hydrogen atom. So here's a couple more examples. We have that hydrogen in, in that second spot, we have a helium, and then we have a neon. And at the very top is white light. This one is also called a continuous spectrum because it is continuous, meaning it's not broken up, it's just that filled in rainbow all the way across. And then notice as we compare hydrogen and helium and neon, they have, as we go down that line, the number of lines of color that we see increases a lot. And it does have to do with the fact that there are more electrons as we move down that line as well. So these spectra, emission spectra, are like a fingerprint. So if we look at any helium atom, it's going to look like that. This is actually one of the ways that they see what elements exist on other planets or in samples that they've gotten. They can look at the emission spectra and compare it to known samples that we have. So let's talk about why this is happening or how it's happening. And we're going to use the Bohr model to explain this. So this is what the Bohr model looks like. We have the nucleus in the center and we have orbits surrounding it. Now we draw this as a 2D flat shape, but you don't want to think of it as something that's flat. We actually want to think of it as the we like to use the word shell because we're going to use that word later on, but it's um, like nesting dolls where we have the, the small nucleus in the center and then a shell around that and then a shell around that and a shell around that. The other way I, I always thought about it too, um, if, have you, if you've ever had one of those really big white jawbreakers and it has all those different layers as you move through it, um, it's, it's like that. So each layer is a different orbit. So the Bohr model can help explain how these atoms are gaining and losing energy. This is something that the nuclear model didn't explain. So really this is kind of taking the nuclear model which said protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, electrons are outside, and this is really just kind of putting some organization to it. The big difference is where those electrons are located. So now we're saying that the electrons have to be on one of those orbits. And the orbits are at very specific distances, which also means that they're at very specific energy levels. And the word we use for this is that we say that the energy is quantized. So that means that we can have an energy level of one and an energy level of two, but we can't be in between. And one of the ways that we use to describe this often is when you're climbing a ladder. You can step on the first rung of the ladder and the second rung and the third rung, but you can't step in between them. There's just nothing there. And the same is true with these orbits. The electrons can exist at that first orbit where n is equal to 1, or the second orbit, or the third, but they can't be anywhere in this in-between zone. It just, it's not an option. So quantized means that we've given it very specific values. Those n values are quantum numbers. And the higher level means higher energy. So n equals 5 out here. This is the highest energy level for this model. And it also means it's the farthest away from the nucleus and it's the biggest size. So let's talk about how that Bohr model can explain those Mickey lights that we saw. 
when an electron is in its lowest energy level, this is called the ground state. So here's my electron right here in its ground state. We're going to hit it with some energy. So I plug in my neon light, I turn it on. This little blue squiggly line right here is representing the energy that is going into the atom. So our energy is being absorbed by the atom. Now, because each of these levels represents a different energy level, if my electron now has more energy, it has to jump to a higher level that represents its new amount of energy. So it jumps to its new level, and where it jumps is going to depend on how much energy it just absorbed. It's not stable up there. It's not stable with that extra energy. It's not where it belongs. So now my electron that's in its excited state is now going to jump to a lower level and release that extra energy. So the red squiggly line is representing the energy that is being released. And again, if it's here and it jumps all the way down, or if it's here and it just jumps to there, that's representing how much energy is being emitted, which is going to change what type of light it is. So whether it's a red light with less energy or a purple light with more energy. So both of those transitions would give us different colored lights. I think the last thing that's on here I didn't say is that when the electron makes those jumps, they're technically called quantum leaps. It's jumping from one level to the next, and it doesn't exist in between those levels, which is kind of weird to think about. But we said that as we go, as we climb our ladder, we can't step on those in between rungs. So your foot leaves the first step and goes on to the second step, it's not stopping in between. So our electrons are kind of doing that also. Now, when we talk about this with hydrogen, every hydrogen atom has the same orbits, which means it can go through the same transitions. So that's why we can look at those emission spectra as a fingerprint. It's going to have the exact same transitions no matter what. And I mentioned this already right here. Those distances between the orbits are going to be different, so it will release different amounts of light. And so even though we have a hydrogen with just that one electron in it, that electron can make those different transitions as it absorbs more or less energy. So here's our hydrogen graph. Our electron can jump from level five to level two, and we will get our violet light. It can jump from level four to level two, and we'll get a bluish green light. And it can jump from level three to level two, and we'll get a reddish light. And when we see a neon light that is made of hydrogen, what we're going to see is a pink light. And this is because most of the transitions are going to be in that red zone. Now, there are some on here that aren't shown. For example, we're not showing anything going from, from one of the orbits down to one. This is going to be so much energy that it's actually not going to be in the visible spectrum anymore. It's now going to be in the UV. So it's not that that doesn't happen. It's just that it's a large enough amount of energy that it's not visible to us. So this is the highest amount of energy, and this is the lowest amount of energy, and we know that for two reasons. One, we can see it on the graph. We can see that the distance being traveled is a large versus small distance. We also can see it in the wavelengths that are provided. We know that smaller wavelengths correspond to higher energy levels. Now this Bohr model is great, but it's not perfect. And it's really good for hydrogen. And honestly, that's kind of about it. So we do use it to explain other atoms, but once we incorporate in atoms that have two or more electrons, which is anything besides hydrogen, it starts to fail because it doesn't account for electron-electron repulsions. So we do need a better theory. 
And so we're going to talk about quantum mechanics for a little bit. And Schrodinger was the one that came up with this, and it's really a combination of probability and wave equations. And so this is where we're in also incorporating in a little bit more light, kind of behind the scenes though. This is very heavy calculus, so we're not doing the math. We're just looking at the results from the math that's been done. And the probability side of it is that because electrons are constantly in motion, Schrodinger was looking at a specific area and trying to narrow it down to say there's a high probability of finding an electron in this area. And there's a big word change. Where the electrons were located in the Bohr model, we referred to them as orbits. Now we are referring to our new model's electron locations as orbitals. We're still using quantum numbers, but we're actually going to have three types of quantum numbers. The first one is called the principal quantum number, and this is an n, so this isn't really any different from our last model. Um, again, just like going from nuclear to Bohr, we kind of just made it more, more specific, more organized. Going from Bohr to quantum mechanics, we again are just kind of diving a little bit deeper. This is adding a lot more calculus behind the scenes, and so it's just making our model a little bit more accurate. Um, the quantum mechanical number is, is the number for the shell. So we're gonna use that word a lot, and it specifies the energy. It's also gonna specify the, speci it's gonna indicate the size. So as N goes up, the size is also gonna go up. The second quantum number refers to the shape of our orbitals. And so a shell is going to contain subshells. The amount of subshells it has is the same as the number. So for example, the third shell, that's when n equals three, has three subshells. So if n equals one, there's only going to be one subshell. So it's a nice trend. So this second quantum number, instead of using a number for it, we actually use a letter. And so the three letters we use are S, P, D, and F. And what these are telling us is the shape. So the first one, the quantum number, the principal quantum number told us the energy level and the size. The second quantum number is telling us the shape. And we can see the shapes at the top here. S is a sphere. P is often referred to as a dumbbell. D is a four-leaf clover. And then F is just kind of a little crazy, but it often gets referred to as a flower. So here's a little summary of of the shell and subshell. So if we are in the first shell, it's only going to have one subshell and it's going to be the S. And we label this as 1S. In that second shell, we will have a 2S and a 2P subshell. And in that third shell, we will have a 3S and a 3P and a 3D. And in the 4S, we'll have, or excuse me, in the fourth shell, we'll have a 4S, a 4P, a 4D, and a 4F. Now, once we go beyond that, five, six, seven, the most amount of subshells we will have is actually four. However, we will not be looking at those. If you're taking general chemistry in the fall or later on, you will move a little bit beyond this. But for now, we're not, we're not gonna be going past that. The difference between a 1s and a 2s is two things. One, we can see here, size. So as we go from the 1s to the 2s, the size is obviously increasing. We can see that in the picture. The thing we can't see in the picture is that the energy is also increasing. So here's a picture of our p orbitals. So this is 
a P subshell. A P subshell contains three orbitals. They are abbreviated as PX, PY, PZ. If you've done math classes where you've graphed on a 3D axis, they're located on the X, Y, and Z axis. If you haven't, it doesn't matter. It's just telling us that we have three orbitals within this subshell that all have the same shape and energy and size. They're just pointed in different directions. In a D subshell, there are five orbitals. And again, most of them have the same shape. They're just kind of pointed in different directions. So starting over here, we have one that's, you know, kind of straight up and down. And then the next one, we've laid it down on its side. And then the next one, we've standed it up, but turned it a little. So they're all similar until you get to this last one, which is just kind of weird. But they do all have the same energy level. Oh, sorry. There we go. And they do, as we compare S, P, D, and F, there's some slight differences in energy. S is going to have the least amount of energy, and F will have the most. And we saw how many orbitals they have in our last couple slides for most of them, but they're summarized right here. So when we have an S subshell, it's going to contain one orbital, and our P subshell is going to contain three orbitals. And this is really our last quantum number, is telling us how many orbitals they each contain. And our D subshell contains these five orbitals, and our F subshell contains seven orbitals. So one, three, five, seven. It's a nice trend there in terms of only using the odd numbers as we go through them. Now, why do we need to know all of that? The reason why we ne need to know all of this is because it's going to help us create electron configurations. We can think of this as an address for the electrons. Now there's three rules. We're gonna talk about one a little bit later on, two right now. But there's three rules in order to figure out the address for the electrons. And the first rule is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And the Pauli exclusion principle says that we can only have two electrons per orbital. Well, we know that an S subshell contains one orbital. And if one orbital can only contain two electrons, then that means an S subshell can only contain two electrons. Our P subshell contains three orbitals. And if each one can contain two electrons, then it can have six electrons, and so on. We know that D has five orbitals and F has seven orbitals, so they can each contain 10 and 14 electrons. The second rule is called the Aufbau principle. Um, Aufbau is German for moving up, and the Aufbau principle says that when we move the electrons into their orbitals, subshells, and shells, we start at the lowest energy level and fill it up, and then go to the next one, fill it up, go to the next one, and fill it up, and so on. So we move the electrons in, lowest energy first, and work our way up. Electrons spin on an axis. So just like the Earth, spins around in a circle, electrons do also. And so when we pair them up, they have to spin in opposite directions. So one will spin clockwise and one will spin counterclockwise. And the way that we represent this is we're gonna draw two arrows. And so when we put our electrons into their little orbitals, we draw them like this. And so that's going to represent two electrons one we label with that up arrow, and we even say that it is spin up, and the other one is spin down. And this isn't really indicating any spinning direction. It's really just saying that they're spinning in opposite directions. So here's a little bit more on those arrows I mentioned. These are called orbital diagrams. And 
when we move our electrons into into their orbitals there's a couple different ways to represent this and one of them is to actually draw it out and we can represent an orbital as a square um, if you're drawing it by hand we usually just represent it with a line just because it's a little bit faster and then the arrows are representing the electrons and again writing it out by hand it's very common to just use these little half arrows but um, PowerPoint didn't have these half arrows so I have my electrons as full arrows so our empty box here is showing an unoccupied orbital the middle one is showing a half filled orbital or an orbital with one electron in it and then the last one is an orbital with two electrons so this would be a filled orbital there isn't room for any more and this one is half filled these are all of our subshells so we're going to talk about how to actually use all this information and we this is kind of a cheat sheet version to put the off bow principle into play but we're starting by writing down all of the shells and subshells. So notice that we have a column of the S subshells, the P, the D, and the F, and then we have the first shell, second shell, third shell, fourth shell, and so on. So we have a column for each subshell, we have a row for each shell, and they're in order of energy. So let me show you what I mean. As we fill up our orbitals, we start by filling in the 1s orbital, and then the 2s, and then the 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and so on. So these arrows are telling us what order to fill in these orbitals based off the energy levels. So this is something that you can write out by hand pretty quickly and draw little arrows or dashed lines going through it to see the order that you're going to use to fill them in. So we're filling them from low energy to high. We're going to use our little cheat sheet to do that. Here's our third rule. So remember I said there was three. We did poly exclusion principle, which said two electrons per orbital. We did off bow, which said low energy to high. Our third rule is called Hund's rule. And Hund's rule says that if we're filling orbitals that have the same energy, we're going to place one electron in each before completing the pairs. So meaning we're going to make them all half filled before we fill them up. And that one I'm really just gonna show you when we do a couple practice ones here in a minute. Um, down here on the bottom, it's showing us the electron configuration of hydrogen. So here is the electron configuration of hydrogen. It's written out as 1s1. So that's telling us that we are in the first shell, in the s subshell, and the number up here is how many electrons it contains. So hydrogen only has one electron, so when we write out 1s1, that's telling us that there's one electron in the s subshell of the first shell. So we're gonna practice this. So we're going to write out the electron configuration and the orbital diagram for the following elements. So we're gonna start with helium. We're starting small. Um, helium has two electrons. And I'm even going to write my little cheat sheet over here so you can see how quickly we can write it. And how big you make it kind of depends on how many or how, how big your elements are that you're using. I think that that's going to be probably more than plenty for our first couple practice ones here. There we go. So I know that my electrons are going to go into that 1s orbital first. I'm following the off-bow principle. So I'm going to start with my orbital diagram. Orbital diagram. So I'm going to draw a line. I'm going to label it as the 1s orbital. One, two. Those are my two electrons. 
That's it. That's the orbital diagram for helium. The electron configuration is really just writing down what we just did. 1s2. There are two electrons in the 1s subshell. All right, moving on. Lithium has three electrons. So my orbital diagram, once I've put those two electrons in the 1s subshell, I ran out of space. So I look over here, and the next one I'm going to use is 2s. So I'm going to draw another line, 2s, and there's my third electron. So my electron configuration for this is 1s2, 2s1. So that tells me that I have two electrons in the 1s subshell and one electron in the 2s subshell. All right, on to beryllium. Beryllium has four electrons. So I'm kind of just moving down the periodic table here. One, two, three, four. And then my electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2. All right, we're gonna do a little bit bigger ones on the next slide. So I'm gonna start by writing out that chart again. Four S, four P, four D, four F, five S, five P, five D, five F. Let me get another color. Okay, so starting with carbon, carbon has six electrons, and this is where we're gonna start to use our third rule, that Hund's rule. So to do my orbital diagram, 1s, 2s. So when I do that, I get to the same point I was at for beryllium. I've put in four electrons, I still have two more left. So the next, the next subshell is the 2p. Now if we remember back when we talked about how many orbitals are in each subshell, there are three orbitals in a p subshell. So when we write that, we need to write three lines. So what that represents is that in the second shell, in the p subshell, there are three orbitals. We have two electrons left, there's my first one, there's my second one. So when I fill in my p orbitals, I'm going to do up, 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 and then down, down, down. This is following Hund's rule. All right, my electron configuration for this then is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Oxygen. Oxygen has eight electrons. My orbital diagram. So I'm gonna fill in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now that those are half filled, I can go back in and do seven and eight. And my electron configuration is going to be one S2, two S2, 2p5, do a little dividing there. All right, iron, I wanted to do one that was a little bit larger in my examples here. Iron has 26 electrons. So orbital diagram, 1s, 2s, 2p, and right now, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10, I know that I would have enough space for 10 electrons, which is not enough. So I look at my chart over here, next is 3s, next is 3p, next is 4s. So we can check to see if we have enough space yet. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, close, but not there. So next is 3d and a D subshell 
contains five orbitals. So S gets one line, P, three lines, D gets five, F would get seven. We're not gonna do any that have F orbitals though. Now I'm gonna put my 26 electrons in there. I'm gonna switch colors so they stand out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. So notice I followed Hun's rule for the d orbitals as well. I went half up, or I went up halfway, and then I started to do in the down arrows. And then the electron configuration, essentially we're just copying down what we just created. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, there we go. Now, I did the iron one kind of on purpose um, as a large one. There's one more way to draw these. So we have three ways to make our electron configuration. We have just the electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2. We have the orbital diagram where we're drawing the arrows. And this is the third way. It's called the noble gas configuration. So we're gonna look at rubidium as our example here. And rubidium has 37 electrons, so even more than iron. There's its electron configuration, it's quite large. The third way we can draw this out though is called the noble gas configuration. And what we're doing is we're taking the noble gas in the previous row putting it in brackets, and that's going to represent all of these electrons. So krypton has 36 electrons, so when we write krypton in brackets there, what we're saying is rubidium is very similar to krypton plus one electron in that 5s subshell. So I'm gonna go back to iron over here The previous noble gas is argon. Argon has 18 electrons. So argon is representing all of this. So I can write out argon, 4s2, 3d6. Now, all three of these things mean the same thing. The electron configuration, the orbital diagram, or now our noble gas configuration, all are telling us the same information, just in different ways. I like to think of this as if you give directions to somebody, how well they know your town or your neighborhood is going to depend, or it will determine how detailed of directions you give them. And these are all kind of that same idea. Two important words we need to talk about are valence electrons and core electrons. And valence electrons are the electrons that are in the highest shell, and core electrons are all the rest of them. And the reason why we single out the valence electrons is because there's a lot of um, factors that are determined by how many valence electrons an atom has. And atoms that share similar properties have the same number of valence electrons. So back to our rubidium example, that electron right here is in the highest shell. So it's in the fifth shell. So rubidium has one valence electron and the remaining 36 electrons are core electrons. Krypton Here's its electron configuration. The fourth shell is the highest shell, so krypton contains eight valence electrons, and the remaining 28 are core electrons. So even though that 4s2 isn't written at the very end, it's still the highest shell number. 
and we can see a trend in the periodic table and our number of valence electrons. So as we go as we go down a column, they have the same number of valence electrons. So everybody in that first column has one valence electron. Second column, two valence electrons. Notice there's a little gap there. We cut out all the transition metals. They don't follow the same trends. So we're just looking at main group elements here. As we go down the next one, we have three valence electrons and so on. Now the difference between rows is where those valence electrons are located. The first row, they're in the first shell. Second row, in the second shell. Third row, they're in the third shell. We also can divide the periodic table up by blockings. And so we refer to the first two columns as the S block, the far right, and actually let me just show you the picture as we talk about this. We refer to these as the S block, the pink area as the P block, the middle transition elements as the D block, and then those inner transition elements as the F block. Uh, this is a really good periodic table. It's showing us the outer electrons of each of the elements um, as we go through that periodic table. So it's just kind of a nice example. The Notice that the row number is telling us where those highest shelled electrons are located. There's a little bit of um, a change that happens when we enter into that D block. So as we go from 4s2 into the D block, the D block number is always going to be one less than the row number. There's also a nice little cheat sheet up here that says that for the main group elements, the number of valence electrons is equal to the column number. So one, two, three, four, and so on. For the transition elements, the number of valence electrons is going to be two. Now there's a couple that just have one. There are exceptions to the rule though, and we'll talk about that in a couple slides. We can use the periodic table as a giant cheat sheet. The periodic table is going to help us determine the electron configuration for those outer elements. And what we do is we find the noble gas from the previous row, and then we use that row number and our SPDF blocks to figure out where those electrons are located. So let me show you an example. We're gonna look at two examples and then we're gonna practice one. So we're gonna look at phosphorus. If we wanna know phosphorus's noble gas configuration, we look for the noble gas in the previous row, which is neon, and then we go until we hit phosphorus. Now neon has 10 electrons and phosphorus has five. So when we write down neon in brackets, that means we need to account for five electrons. That's 3s1, 3s2, 3p1, 3p2, 3p3. So that tells us that phosphorus's noble gas configuration is neon, 3s2, 3p3. I know it's three because it's in the third row. These are s because they're in the s block and these are p because they're in the p block. What about arsenic? So for arsenic, Arsenic has 33 electrons. We're gonna look at that noble gas in the previous row again, so which is um, argon. Argon has 18 electrons, arsenic has 33 electrons. So we need to account for 15 extra electrons. So there's argon, we're gonna do the same thing. We're going into that next row. We go through the four S's, we go through the three D's, and then into the four P's. So four S1 and four S2, once we get to that D block, the shell number is one less than the row number. So this right here is 3D1. We go all the way through, we get to 3D10. So this is 3D10 right here. So zinc is in the 3D10 and then 4P1, 4P2, 4P3. So our noble gas configuration is argon, 4S2, 
3d10, 4p3, and if we look at how many electrons are right there, that is 15. So that accounts for the, th the 18 electrons in argon plus those 15 give us our 33 electrons total. It's just kind of a nice way to check to make sure you didn't miss anybody. All right, we're gonna practice one. So we're gonna look at silver. So here is our previous noble gas, krypton. Krypton has 36 electrons, silver has 47. So we need to find those extra 11 electrons. So I'm gonna start right here. I gotta go all the way over to silver. So this is, and I don't have um, row numbers, so I'm just gonna fill those in. We're gonna say one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So right where rubidium is, this is 5s1, 5s2, and then we have d, but we know the number is going to be one less. So this right here is 4d1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So the noble gas configuration for silver is krypton 5s2, 4d9. If it was cadmium, it would be 4d10. If it was palladium, it would be 4d8. The location on the periodic table is telling us where those electrons are located. Of course, there has to be exceptions to the rule. And there's two exceptions that you need to know chromium and copper. Chromium and copper are both in the D block and chromium exception is instead of being 4s2 3d4 we want to make it more stable. Subshells are going to be the most stable when they are fully filled or half filled not somewhere in between. So instead of doing this this is chromium's noble gas configuration, 4s1, 3d5, because what that does is it makes the orbital half filled. Copper's our other exception, and so copper's noble gas configuration is 4s1, 3d10, and so there's its orbital diagram. And notice that these each now only have one valence, one valence electron. Because the columns have the same numbers of, val of valence electrons, this is explaining some of the properties that we've already talked about. For example, our noble gases are very inert and are very non-reactive. This is because they have completely filled orbitals, which makes them especially stable. It also means, though, that elements that are very close by halogens and alkali metals are even more reactive because they are so close to having this noble gas configuration that they just need to lose one or gain one electron to be there. So our alkali metals each only have one valence electron and if they can lose that valence electron they will have an electron configuration just like the previous noble gas. and our halogens are the same but on the opposite end. So they just need to gain that one electron in order to be like the closest noble gas and then they can also have that stable filled orbital. All right, last thing in this section is looking at ions and with our ions, just like we said with the, the last couple slides there, the electrons are being gained or lost in order to look like a noble gas. So we have a couple cations and a couple anions. Here's our cations and here's their electron configuration. If they lose one, two, or three electrons, they will end up looking just like neon and their charge will match however many electrons they lost. And then with our anions there, in order to have those p orbitals filled, oxygen is going to gain two electrons, fluorine is going to gain one, and when that happens, they will end up looking just like neon as well. 
All right, we're gonna switch over to the second half of the chapter, and in this half, we're gonna talk about three different periodic trends. The first one is looking at size, and we can think of this as either volume or radius, but our size is, is we have two trends for each of these. We're gonna look at how it increases or decreases across a row, and then down a period. So our atomic size is going to decrease as we go across a row, and this is because the number of protons are also increasing, and so that's drawing the electrons in closer. It's making a stronger attraction. But as we go down a column, our atomic size is going to increase. So we can see a nice trend on this graph. Cesium down here is the largest, and helium is the smallest, so as we go across in a diagonal, our size is increasing. So, which atom is larger, carbon or oxygen? So there's my carbon, there's my oxygen, they're in the same row, so as we go across that row, it's getting smaller, so oxygen is actually going to be smaller. Carbon's our larger atom out of those two. What about lithium or potassium? As we go down a column, it's getting larger. So potassium is going to be our larger atom. And then what about carbon or aluminum? So we already know where carbon is. Let me underline it again. And aluminum. So aluminum is in the next row down and it's farther to the left. So aluminum will be the larger. Here's our overall trend as we're going in that direction. Our size is increasing. The next trend is ionization energy. This is how much energy it takes to remove an electron from an atom. As we go down a column, our ionization energy is decreasing. And as we go across a row, our ionization energy is increasing. This is the completely opposite trend from the size. And it makes sense because if an atom is smaller, those electrons are being held in tighter, it's going to be harder to remove an electron, so it's going to require more energy. So the smaller an atom is, the higher its ionization energy is. So here's our trend. Um, so really as we go across this way, our ionization energy is increasing. We, if you think of it, whether you think of it as up and down or a diagonal trend is up to you, but that's kind of the overall trend there. So which atom is going to have a larger ionization energy? We have magnesium versus phosphorus. So here's my magnesium, here's my phosphorus. So as we go uh, across that row from magnesium to phosphorus, our ionization energy is increasing. And what about arsenic and antimony? Um, so here is arsenic and here is antimony. As we go down the row, our ionization energy is decreasing. So that means arsenic would have a higher ionization energy. And then our last group there, we have nitrogen and silicon. And silicon is in the next row down um, and farther over to the left. So as we go down and farther to the left, our ionization energy is is going to decrease, so that means that our nickel will have the larger ionization energy. Last trend. The last trend is metallic character. So here's a couple, not, not a full list, but a couple properties of metals and nonmetals. And our metallic character, as we go down a column, the metallic character is going to increase. And as we go across a row, our metallic character is going to decrease. So again, we have this nice um, diagonal trend. 
our metallic character increasing as we go across our periodic table. And for this one, if we think of our stairs here, the closer we get to the stairs, we're going to have something that's more metal-like. If you kind of use that as your guideline for starting this trend, it, it helps to, to make sense out of it. So we have tin versus tellurium, and because our trend is going across our periodic table this way, that means that tin is going to be more metallic. And if we're comparing silicon versus tin, as we go down, we're also becoming more metallic. And then that last one there, we have bromine versus tellurium. So tellurium is a little bit lower, so it's also going to be more metallic. All right. Last slide is looking at all these trends together. So this is just kind of a nice summary slide of the ionization energy and atomic radius and metallic character. The green arrows are showing us electronegativity. Um, we don't need that for this chapter, but we will need it for the next, so I left it in there. And then the metallic character is balanced out with non-metallic character as well, just so you see that in there. But that is it. Thank you.